Hello, it's Rachel. So there's been a lot of discourse about these two films, and I've seen a lot of people lauding them as feminist masterpieces. And while I did not trust those assessments, I was curious and wanted to check out Barbie and Four Things for myself. And okay, before I start digging into my thoughts, I want to say that I've seen people brush off criticisms towards both of these films as people not understanding the point. And I'm sorry, but that's just some bullshit. I'm on Tumblr, I've seen people write paragraphs of meta when a narrative punishes their favorite character for a justified decision, and I've seen the same when a narrative rewards a character they hate for a shitty one. I know you guys can't think critically, but there seems to be a refusal to do so when it comes to popular content. And I'm tired of people consuming media on autopilot. When passively engaging with media, that's when a person is more likely to internalize harmful ideas. Anyway, let's get to some analysis. Woof, where to start with Barbie? I knew from the opening scene that I was going to hate it. There's a letterboxed review that calls this film, quote, the most dissatisfying response to the incel crisis, end quote. And I think that really hits the nail on the head. So my main issue with this film is that Barbie Land wants to be reality in reverse. It's a matriarchal society where men solely exist to be props because they apparently only matter in relation to Barbie, as the joke is that girls want Barbie dolls and any Ken dolls are a second thought. But Barbie land doesn't have to reflect our current society, it's a fantasy world. And I guarantee the majority of kids who play with Barbies weren't thinking up a political reality. We were playing dress up and making the dolls kiss and recreating scenes from films. My expectation going into Barbie was that this was basically going to be the Lego movie, but for Barbie. And to some degree, it is similar an idea, but it would have been so much better if the narrative fully leaned into that and it was just some absurd fantasy of some kids playing with their dolls that the audience is experiencing through the doll's perspective. Anyway, the point is Greta Gerwig could have done anything with Barbie Land and she decided to make it a matriarchal society where the men are largely ignored by the women. And Barbie Land is structured this way specifically so Ken can learn about patriarchy when he and Barbie go to the real world, and then he can bring those ideas back to Barbie Land. Which, like, how the hell did he convince every single person, excluding Alan and Weird Barbie and the discontinued dolls, apparently, to go along with this? Yeah, Barbie Land mirrors our reality, but does capitalism exist there? If it doesn't, what does power even mean in Barbie Land? How do you form a hierarchical structure if money does not exist? And if it does, how would money even be used in the society as it seems like everyone just automatically has all their needs met? Whatever, I'm clearly thinking about the mechanics too much, as the movie doesn't care to think about these things, and I don't want to think about it more than I already have. The fact is that there were endless things that Barbie Land could have been, and we got what we did so we could get a fucking narrative of what if the oppressed become the oppressors. Like, god, it's so obvious that this was thought up by a white person. The whole concept of this movie is to depict a man being radicalized into right-wing ideology, but then the film says absolutely nothing of substance. It's all just fucking lampshading. There is absolutely no attempt at critique, it's literally just observations presented as jokes. And before anyone starts with the arguments of it's not trying to be a feminist masterpiece, it's just an introduction to feminism. No, it didn't have to broach these topics at all. It could have just been an absurdist romp given this film exists to be a Mattel commercial. But instead, the writers attempted to engage with topics that they clearly weren't comfortable discussing with any depth. And to make matters worse, this film is so dedicated to prioritizing Ken's feelings. We are supposed to feel bad for him when Barbie doesn't want to give him attention because of her lack of interest in a romantic relationship with him. We are supposed to care about him when he has created this patriarchal society and brainwashed the majority of the inhabitants of Barbie land. We are supposed to find him somewhat pathetic for being so obsessed with Barbie, but we are also supposed to find him endearing as evidenced by I'm just Ken. Meanwhile, he won't take no for an answer and incessantly pesters Barbie for attention and gets mad when she shows attention to the other Kens. Like, yeah, it's pretty clear Ken himself isn't going to get violent towards Barbie, but this kind of behavior does absolutely lead to violence towards women in the real world. And I don't like a narrative trying to manipulate me into being sympathetic to such a character, nor do I enjoy being manipulated to view him as vaguely annoying but ultimately harmless. It's red flag behavior. I don't find it cute in real life or in media. 
it's just so mind-boggling to me that this film is supposed to be all about femininity and womanhood, and yet we still end up focusing on fucking Ken and how Barbie has hurt his feelings. At the end of the film, Barbie even has to give a speech to comfort him after order is restored to Barbie land, because of course this film thinks correcting his behavior is her responsibility. And how is order restored, you may ask? Good question! Gloria, the human who created the rift between Barbie Land and the real world, gives a big emotional monologue that is just repackaged being a woman is suffering talking points. And then all the Barbies concoct a scheme to make the Kens turn against each other so they can stage a coup and retake control of the government. Because that's representative of equality, also, as nice as it is to believe that having a heart-to-heart -heart with someone who has been radicalized is enough to de-radicalize them, in what world would that work? De-radicalization means the person has to unlearn the biases they hold. If Ken was an accurate depiction of the type of person that this film is attempting to critique, he would absolutely view Barbie as lesser than him and would never listen to a word she says. This is the problem with the film's entire analogy. Ken never fully bought into the idea of patriarchy, he just wanted to stop being a second-class citizen and figured following the norms of human society was the way to do it. The movie wants us to laugh at misogynists when it reduces men's misogyny to a bunch of interests, like horses and violent media, or having women serve them food. Like, yeah, that is definitely an aspect of misogyny, but again, this film did not at all acknowledge the very real violence that women are subjected to regularly. Also, we need to discuss the way this film engages with beauty standards. Like, can we talk about the fact that the inciting incident for Barbie's journey is her fear of becoming ugly like Weird Barbie, who honestly is labeled as weird because of an unconventional wardrobe and haircut? She's still a thin, blonde, white woman who aligns with Eurocentric beauty ideals in a lot of ways. And cellulite is treated as the end of the world. Barbie is horrified when she notices it at the beginning of the film, and then it is never brought up again. Like, cool, let's shame people for a very normal skin condition. This film clearly wanted props for having Barbies of color and fat Barbies, and I also briefly spotted a Barbie in a wheelchair. But they're all set dressing and have no interior lives. Hell, the only two characters of color who are even vaguely fleshed out are Gloria and Sasha, two white adjacent Latinas. The whole emotional crux of the film relies on their dynamic, but we don't really know anything about them other than Glory has been feeling a bit depressed and Sasha is an angsty, moody teen. Also, do not get me started on the fact that the film very clearly wanted brownie points for Hari Neff, a trans model and actress, playing one of the Barbies, but then it's never made explicit that she's trans. And then there's a handful of sexist jokes about the doll's genitals, as well as another joke where one of the male employees says, I'm a man without power. Does that mean I'm a woman? And to continue with that line of thought, there's no explicitly gay characters, which means even in this utopian Barbie land that heterosexuality is the expectation, which was a choice from Greta Gerwig. The closest we get to a gay character is Alan as he doesn't fall for Ken's brainwashing and is desperate to escape Barbie Land once it becomes a patriarchal society, and then he quickly and seamlessly joins the Barbies. Like, between this and the Mattel employee asking if he was a woman, this movie is really saying if a man doesn't perform manhood correctly, that they are basically a woman. Because that's not a misogynistic belief that isn't already normalized, and that idea totally doesn't fuel a ton of violence and abuse towards young boys. Also, just want to say that the smallpox jokes was so much worse than I was mentally prepared for, and the idea that people are defenseless against an ideology is so infuriating. Like, no, if you genuinely believe everyone is equally valuable, no matter what identities they hold, then you are not going to fucking fall for incel bullshit. The defense against hateful ideology is listening to marginalized people. Why do people from privileged backgrounds always want to absolve bigoted people of being held accountable for their beliefs and actions? Fuck off, Greta.
And last thing I want to mention, because this was really the cherry on top of the shit Sunday. Okay, so the film opens with a bunch of girls playing with dolls that look like babies. And the narrator gives this whole monologue about how before the invention of Barbie, that little girls could only really play at being a mother. This is the opening scene. The final scene of this goddamn film is Barbie going to the gynecologist. We have truly gone full circle into hell. The fucking script starts with a rant about how girls were forced into the role of mother. And then the film ends with Barbie being reduced to her genitals and the implications of motherhood further in the future. What a fucking joke. I fucking love this film. So before I tear into Poor Things, I want to admit that upon my initial watch, once I got past the first hour, I actually found myself kind of enjoying it. Like, I was grossed out by how sexually Bella behaved during the child stages, and I was aware in the back of my mind that the narrative was fetishistic of women with developmental disabilities, but I did somehow like some of the twists and turns due to just how unexpected everything is. But the more I thought about it afterwards, the more disgusting the film became to me. First off, we should probably start the discussion with the fact that Godwin found a nearly dead pregnant woman who had attempted suicide, and instead of saving the baby and letting this woman be at peace, he transplanted the baby's brain into her head. So, one, clearly that's violating the consent of the pregnant woman, and it shows that Godwin reduces people to experiments and does not care about other people's bodily autonomy. And two, this poor woman who tried to kill herself is now having her body violated repeatedly. I know the entire film hinges on such a decision, but it never really grapples with how deeply fucked up this is. It is more treated as very unconventional and a way to establish Godwin's brilliance. Which leads me to the next issue. This film is kind of normalizing childhood sexual assault. The first scene that really took me aback was the scene where Bella discovers masturbation. She is very clearly still in her child stages, especially since only like 10 minutes prior, we were watching her pee herself because she didn't know how to walk or use the bathroom. And the scene of Bella discovering orgasms is long and nauseating. I physically could not look at the screen until it was over. Anyway, after that, Bella soon gets sexually curious, which like, yeah, that makes sense. It's true for a lot of teenagers. But Bella is surrounded by adult men, there is no one remotely close to her age, and she runs away with Duncan, who is a philanderer. She still very clearly has not reached adulthood when this happens, and she and Duncan are having sex incessantly. And the camera takes every chance it can to linger on Emma Stone's body during these sex scenes. I know there's a lot of discussions about the prevalence of sex in media, and generally speaking, I'm pro-sex scenes, but if it's just there to ogle a woman's naked body, I don't care for it. And that felt like the reasoning for these sex scenes. Also, I've seen a few negative reviews on Letterboxd that argue that the film's thought process is that sexual activity is the key to a girl maturing and becoming a woman, which I hope no one needs an explanation as for why that's fucked up. And I honestly find it hard to disagree with this take. The film is incredibly obsessed with Bella's sexual exploits, and it honestly feels like the sex scenes make up the majority of the film. Maybe I'm exaggerating in terms of how much screen time is devoted to the sex scenes, but the film doesn't care too much about Bella's interior life other than her relationships with Duncan, Godwin, Max, and Alfie, before someone tries to argue that Harry, Martha, and Toinette broadened her mind to other aspects of the world, I mean, technically yes, but the film is disinterested in exploring this. Harry and Martha introducing Bella to philosophy and Harry exposing her to poverty happened solely to cause a rift between her and Duncan. The film has no interest in actually delving into the ideas she is learning about. It's mostly acknowledged by her enjoying reading, which angers Duncan. Toinette introduces her to socialism, and we only know that because of a quick joke when Bella is telling Duncan to leave her alone. 
The film very actively does not give a shit about these ideas because it is far too concerned with presenting itself as a depiction of sexual liberation. Which, a minor being sexually active with adults is not something I find to be positive. Also, just want to say that this film treads a fine line between Bella being a child slash teenager and Bella being developmentally disabled. I've seen a lot of comments on Letterboxd of people saying that since Bella is developmentally disabled that she cannot possibly consent to sex. And that's not a good takeaway in my opinion. Developmentally disabled people can and do have sex and it's pretty infantilizing to say otherwise. On to the men, I guess. Um, Barbie fans aren't going to like this take, but Duncan is basically poor things Ken. They're both easily jealous and attempt to control their respective romantic partners, yet the narrative wants us to laugh at them and wants us to view them as pathetic, not as dangerous. Basically, the only difference is that Duncan is actually sexually active and he'll threaten physical violence, even if the narrative portrays him as too cowardly to actually follow through. While Poor Things is aware that Duncan is grooming Bella, the film doesn't care to explore how this abuse would affect Bella's mental health. Poor Things doesn't want us to view him as a genuine threat. We are supposed to view him more as a nuisance, an annoyance, than fear violence from him. Also, Duncan is a very large source of humor for this film, which I think trivializes the fact that he is grooming her. Next, we should discuss Godwin, Bella's father figure, As I've already mentioned, he completely violated Victoria, the pregnant woman. Um, He completely violated Victoria's bodily autonomy when he created Bella. This violence isn't even acknowledged as violence by the film. Hell, he even has the name Godwin, and Bella regularly refers to him as God. I think it's pretty clear that the film itself deifies him. We, like Max, are supposed to be enamored with his brilliant mind and never question any of his decisions because he's a genius. Bella doesn't learn of her origins until the final third of the movie, and she pretty much immediately forgives Godwin, even planning to marry Max, which Godwin attempted to arrange before she fled with Duncan, and continue his work. Max is Godwin's protege, a medical student who basically worships Godwin and is selected to become his assistant. And what does Godwin want an assistant for? Basically to be Bella's babysitter and take notes on her development. So, Max is a full-grown adult, and Bella is a literal child in an adult body. And after they spend some time together, Godwin basically tries to convince Max to enter a romantic relationship with Bella. And while Bella is still very much a minor, Max somehow falls for her? Huh? No one involved in creating this film thought that that was fucking weird? The narrative just wants us to accept this as normal because Emma Stone is an adult and it doesn't want us to use our brains. Bella runs away before anything can happen between her and Max, and then we don't really see Max again until Bella has reached adulthood, and then they seemingly end up together. Which really makes it feel like the film is rewarding him for not taking advantage of her sexually, which would be gross regardless, but is extra gross given the PDF file aspect. Poor Things does overtly acknowledge misogynistic violence with the reveal that Victoria had killed herself to escape an abusive husband, Alfie. But this development happens so late in the film, and it feels more like the writers really wanted to shove in a scene of Bella standing up to an explicitly violent man. It honestly feels half-baked, like a random plot point that was just tacked on to the end of the film. And the resolution of Alfie threatening genital mutilation against Bella is her dragging him back to Godwin's lab, following Godwin's notes about how he created her, and transplanting a goat brain into Alfie's head. So I guess that says something about cycles of abuse for her refuse to let Alfie bleed out and to take away his bodily autonomy instead. If you can't tell, I absolutely hated that decision. I really don't think taking away someone's bodily autonomy is ever a good thing. It is never justice. And the film definitely wants us to view this as a girl boss moment. Also, why not just let the creep die? It's like weirdly carceral messaging because apparently we live in a society that is more comfortable having bodily autonomy stripped away from people considered undesirable than to have someone kill their abuser in self-defense. So that's cool. The reason I wanted to discuss these two films together is that they really do interact and mirror each other in a lot of ways. 
Both of these films follow women, or, well, technically a girl in Bella's case, who interact with the real world for the first time. Barbie because she's a doll from another reality, and Bella because she's a child transplanted into an adult body and was confined to her pseudo-father's house. While Barbie is focused on keeping the men and women separate for the most part, Poor Things prioritizes women's relationships with men over their relationships with each other's. While Barbie is very sanitized, being incredibly disinterested in sex or romance, Poor Things is hypersexual, almost reducing Bella to her sex life. Barbie, the character, embodies a lot of traits that Western society would consider traditionally feminine. She's polite, outgoing, and eager to please others. Meanwhile, Bella rejects most of these traits. She's very brash, unafraid to become violent, and pleasure-seeking. Barbie decides to become human, rejecting a return to her utopia, while Bella returns to her home to follow in her pseudo-father's footsteps. It's two sides of the same coin, opposite ends of the white feminism spectrum. I specify white feminism because neither film really cares much about identities that fall outside of able-bodied cishet white people. Neither film has an interest in truly fleshing out any characters of color, and the ones getting the most attention are white adjacent, Sasha and Gloria and Barbie, and Max and Poor Things. As I've already mentioned, the characters of color are set dressing and Barbie, and in Poor Things, Harry and Toinette's personal lives only matter in how it propels Bella's self-discovery. As for discussions of sexual orientation, I'm sure some of you who have seen Poor Things are probably screaming, Rachel, what about the sex scene between Toinette and Bella? And yeah, it's true that did occur in the film. But the film doesn't care to explore that dynamic as a true romance. Like, I'm not going to deny their identities as sapphic women. But it feels like the scene mostly exists to have an excuse for Toinette to discover Bella's wound and cause her to learn about her origins. I mean, Toinette literally disappears after that scene until the final couple minutes of the film. Like, genuinely, how is their bond developed after they have sex and cuddle? Toinette disappears and then Bella is immediately ready to marry Max. Babes, please have higher standards for gay rep coming from an American production company in 2023. Then there's also the fact that neither film knows how to commit to the commentary they are trying to make. Barbie wants to warn about radicalization by imagining up a society that feeds into incel fears, while Poor Thing wants to be a satire that discusses how men groom and manipulate women, where two of the four men who do so are supposed to be endearing to the audience. And both Barbie and Bella are forced by their narratives to graciously accept crossed boundaries by Barbie being forced to apologize to Ken and Bella not being allowed to be angry with Godwin. I'm losing my mind. Like whatever content you want, but please stop claiming either of these are feminist films. Acknowledging that a piece of media you like is trying to normalize harmful ideas is actually a necessary part of media consumption to avoid internalizing said harmful ideas. Enjoying media that contains harmful ideas does not make you a bad person. Anyway, end of my PSA begging people to use critical thinking skills when consuming entertainment. Thank you for listening to this ramble. This was longer than I intended for it to be. And I'm sure there are things I forgot since I didn't want to watch either film a second time. I'd love to hear other people's thoughts, so please feel free to leave a comment. Keep talking about Palestine. It is 175 days into the Israeli army committing genocide. Palestine Action has actually just shut down a branch of Elbit Systems, so progress is being made even if it doesn't feel like it. Keep talking about Sudan and Congo. Please donate to one of the links in the bio, or if that's not possible, keep protesting and sharing updates. Keep pushing. If our governments need to be pressured into doing what's right, then we will keep protesting and emailing and boycotting with our dollars. Also, COVID rates have been continuing to go up and up since the holidays. Please, please stay safe and continue masking or start masking again if you've stopped. There was a new vaccine that was made for recent variants back in September, and it's about time to get a booster if you got that shot in September or October. If you never got that shot. This is probably a good time to get it. Hopefully I'll see you again soon and have a great rest of your day.